all right welcome back guys so yeah so like i said this is the um, third session of the introduction to software testing so it's been hosted by the city of god rccg in crayford in london so and if you want to contact us so you got our details in there so you can contact us using admin at rccgcityofgod.com so it's a free online training that we offer so there are other trainings that we do offer to also introduction to it excel word um, testing with java and also testing with c sharp so and vdd with specflow and cucumber so we have different yeah um, training that we do offer so yeah you can get in touch if you want to enroll for any of our free courses Yeah, so today we're going to go through the other part of the introduction. So I'll start with test design techniques. So there are different test design that we need to, techniques that we need to talk about today. So let's go through that quickly. So, so uh, last week I briefly mentioned specification based te um, testing, which is also called black box testing. So, and I said also is one type of dynamic testing. So today, we're going to look into into that also. So, which type of techniques can you use for specification based testing? So, so like like I said last week also, specification based is when you have requirement actually. So and also, it's black box because you don't know, you don't understand, or you don't have knowledge of the structure of the applications. So basically, you can uh, you cannot check inside the box. So the box is so it's black. So so what you're going to be concentrating on is what the software or the application does on how. Uh, not how he does it. So not how he's going to do it, but what exactly he does. So that's what you're going to be concentrating upon. So you could use it for both functional and also non-functional testing. So, but majorly, I think people use um, specificational testing for functional testing. So, and to test its features and also is functions also so but if you want to use for non-functional testing you will rather focus on on you focus basically on how the system does something not what it does basically like the speed and also like the accuracy and something like the load so but it's basically how it does that particular uh, feature know what exactly that feature is about so so today we're going to talk about all those techniques that you can use for specification based um, approach and also like i said also there's also structure based um, testing techniques we're going to look into also so for structure based as i said you have privy to the internal structure of the software to derive your test cases so you can look into the application you can see what the structure is all about so that's why it is called you know, white box because you can see through the application you can know the structure of the application you can see the pseudocode of the application you can see the code you can see uh, what is what actually makes that software to work so you can it, you also have the knowledge of how this that sort of particular software is implemented so that's why it's called like a lax box you can see through what is inside so and you know what the loops is you know what the statement is you can actually measure on different conditions that are covered you can know how many times a loop is executed so those are the things that you look into when you're doing your uh, structure based testing so and also you have experience based testing so for experience based testing 
So you only use that when you don't have access to the requirements. Or that's one thing also. And also very, very important that you have the skills and also you have the knowledge of the application that you are testing. And also you have the background also. It's, those are very, very prime contributors to your test conditions. You, you have the background knowledge. You have the knowledge. You have the skills of, of that particular application. So those knowledge could be both technical or business. So, so that you can be able to bring that into into the testing. So you need to have different perspectives of the test analysis and also the design process. So it's very, very important. So you could also bring your experience uh, on similar applications that you, you've tested similar application and you can bring that in to, to say, okay, oh, I've tested this application. I've not tested this application before, but I've tested similar application that looks the same thing. So in that approach, you can use experience-based techniques for, for that. So, so in this approach now, so where do you now apply different categories of testing? What do you use to determine which type of testing to use. So like I said um, before now, specification-based techniques are appropriate for any level of testing. And also, most importantly, the specification must assist. You must have the specification. You must have a document that you can use to test that application. Then also, for structure-based techniques, it's basically used by most developers for unit testing and integration testing. So, and you can use it when you, you can have a good tool that will be able to, you'll be able to use to measure code coverage. That, okay, you can say how many statements have I covered, how many decisions has it covered. So there are some tools right now that draws that for you, basically. It goes into your core and be able to, you know, uh, measure the uh, you, how the metrics about your unit testing so to see how many coverage of your um, code has been covered by your test so so that is also very very important in for structure based techniques so for experience one actually like i said you can use it to complement uh, structure uh, specification base or in a case where there is no specification at all so, or that specification is inadequate or is out of date. So in that regard, there's nothing for you to base your testing on for specification uh, using specification based approach. So for that reason, you might have to use your experience based on similar application. So, so yeah, that is how you can actually uh, apply different categories of, of these techniques and you can actually select the right one that you can use at any particular time. So when you start to test, you need to know what's the approach that you want to use actually based on if you have specification and if you have a, a document, then you need to use specification based. If there's no document also, then you might use experience. If you have access to the code and you can see the code, you can, yeah, uh, obviously to that then yeah structure based techniques is is appropriate all right so now let's talk about the test techniques so there are different techniques that we're going to talk about today but I'll focus on most important two the two one that I think is very very important for um people that join the testing for from beginning as in for for beginners so as i said last week right so or two weeks ago i think uh, exhaustive testing it's not possible at all for testing which is one of the principles of testing you can you cannot say that i have tested this application Exclusively, you cannot say I have covered every scenario possible. For a trivial application, yes, but for a complex application, you might not be able to say, to, to say that. But now, if you cannot say I've covered everything, 
is that good enough? No, it's not good enough. But that's where the test uh, techniques help you to reduce the number of test cases that you can use to execute, you can, you, that can be used actually, while you increase your test coverage. So you can be able to say, yeah, I've covered all the scenarios, I've covered all the test cases that are, have been alighted based on your test coverage. So that's where you need to know your tech, uh, testing techniques properly and also know the appropriate one for the application that you are testing. Because if you use the right techniques, then you can easily identify the test conditions that are sometimes difficult to recognize. You can actually use the right test conditions for, for that particular purpose. So, so as you can see on on 3D diagram, you have different type of testing. I've said last time, also static testing where you don't even need to execute the application. And you have dynamic testing where you execute the application. And we're going to focus on on dynamic today. So we're not going to focus on static testing. So we're going to focus on dynamics today. So, and in terms of specification, you can see, we have use cases, we have decision table, equivalence, partitioning, we have boundary value analysis, you know, analysis we have state you know, transition. And also, in experience, you can use error guessing, you can use exploratory testing, and also structure-based testing, you can So for, for today, as I said, we're going to focus on dynamic testing. So, and for dynamic testing, and I would be focusing on two, which is equivalent partitioning and also boundary value analysis. So for today, I, I think for every tester, every tester should be able to know this particular two techniques very well, to be honest. So uh, I'll focus on that even this evening, so then we can continue. So yeah, equivalent partitioning. So like I said, it's a good all-round specification-based uh, techniques. So you can use it at any level of testing. And it, I would say I strongly recommend that this is a good technique to use first. To use if you if you are testing and you don't know this approach, I think you know, you are not actually testing properly. I think when I started the introduction, I said everyone could do testing, everyone can do testing, everyone will be able to do testing. But this is when the chips are down, to be honest. So when you now need to use the techniques to have you to be able to do your testing properly, this is where you need to know when to do your testing and how to do your testing. It's different from uh, an ad hoc tester that just become testing and just start testing. But for you to be a professional tester, you need to use the right techniques. So what is one of those things on test on techniques that you need to use also? So you, you could say, yeah, basically, equivalent testing is common sense approach, actually. So, but Sometimes they say common sense is not that common, even though it is a common sense. So it's not that common to everyone. So most testers will normally may not practice this actually, even though you think it's a common sense. So the idea of this testing is to divide your test cases into two, into groups. So sets that can be considered to be the same are put into one partition, and the other sets are put into another partition. So you you divide these test cases into groups or sets. So each of the sets can now be considered and treated in a different way. So then what's going to happen now, if you have your test condition, so you group them into parts that could be treated the same way. Then from in the group, you now select that is, um, a test case from that group. So you don't have to test everything. You only need to co focus on those groups that you've selected. Uh, I, I will give an example later. So, so what, uh, in this case, you only need one 
test condition for each of the partition, like I said. So uh, I was I was given a, an instance of that. So this is because you we assume we assume that each partition will behave this the same way, and because if partition will behave the same way, they could be treated the same way, also. So and that is the assumption. But technically, I think that assumption will be true. So that's what you we need to work. But if the condition in the partition does not work or they don't behave the same way, then you have not been able to partition it properly. So you need to know that partition that you are doing will should behave the same way, and then you can be able to use them. Um, I'll put one test cases on one test case to that particular partition. So. Now, let's go to an example. A simple example is if you have an ap application that accepts number from 1 to 100. So, and you can know that this application or an app is going to have a valid number and can accept this valid number, any number from 1 to 100. So, uh, hold on. I think this is wrong, actually. It's, it should be one minute so one minute all right so i said an application that accepts a number from 1 to 99 so that means we have invalid invalid numbers from 1 to 99 so which means that you're going to have invalid numbers also so your invalid number will be any number greater than 99 or any number less than one so then, of course, numerical numbers. So we now have two partitions right now. One partition is the valid partition, and one partition is the invalid partition. That's a simple way to actually partition your test cases. To say, okay, let me focus on the valid one. What, my, what are my valid ones? So what are my invalid ones? So, and then once you are able to um, partition that into that section, then you can now say treat the valid one as the same, right? The valid one you can tell, select any number from one to ninety-nine with the assumption that they will behave the same way. So even if you take one, two, three, four, or any ninety-nine, so they are going to behave the same way. They are going to, if you enter that, it's going to be the same number, the same test case that you are doing. So that is the assumption for equivalent partition. So also then you go to invalid. Mm, partition. So invalid partition can have also different groups also. You can say oh, the first group that we have is any number greater than 99. So in that group you can decide to take any number that is above 99. So and you the assumption is that number they will behave the same thing. That your system should reject that number. So for if you put 100, 101 to any number that number should should be rejected, and also the same way also for any number that is greater than or less than one also it's going to be an invalid um, data, so then your application should also reject that um, um, number so the same way also for numerical um, numbers also so non numerical rather so like alphanumeric special characters so the list is endless at this particular time. You can, you can, yeah, you cannot do exhaustive testing at this point because there are lots of things that you can, you can actually uh, combine. Yeah, there are different combinations of. You talk about special character. You talk about combining different numbers together. You talk about maybe uh, if you're talking about integer numbers, now you be talking about invalid numbers. Also, could be negative numbers. So, yeah, all these are kind of in this particular scenario. So, so this is what uh, I am. We are saying in this particular equivalence partitioning. So, the next uh, method uh, or techniques is boundary value analysis. Boundary value analysis. So, this is based you base your testing on boundaries between partitions and as a developer they know that this is kind of one of the big issues so if you ever written program before and you've written like if a is equal to b or a is equal to c or a is equal to two 
let's assume on a normal scenario in this particular case if you are going to be writing a program that are set to 1 to 99 maybe you will say if uh, a is greater than 99 so that is invalid so but in that regard a tester can or maybe a developer who want to write greater than 99 and just say greater and put greater or equal to 99 that is a mistake because what's going to happen is like so that application normally should reject um, should reject any number greater than 99 but because you you now put equal to that means if you supply 99 it's going to reject 99 so that what it happens so that's what can happen in this particular scenario so if I say that one again for instance if you are a developer and you are writing a code and you can say this application should reject a number greater than 99 you can say if X is greater than 99 let's say the developer was about to write that and his name is John John was about to say if X is greater than 99 then reject this uh, or say error error or something like that and John is about to do that and James comes in and say John uh, let's go for a coffee uh, okay yeah then they went for a coffee and then he comes back again and you oh then he maybe forgot where he was on his own thought and he just decided to put equal to again so then before that then what's going to happen then the application would not accept 99 even though it should accept 99 because instead of saying greater than he has now put greater or equal to 99 so those are the issues that happens during programming it's going to be like a little mistake like that that developer has made so that's where you need to design your test cases properly to capture any issues like this so so that if you now use the boundary value analysis so you design your test cases based on boundary between partitions so we've decided we've no uh, partitions before like we have the other one we have both boundary um, partitions and we have invalid boundaries also in the one that we have so you can decide to separate your partition into two but you need to look at those test cases it might not be as easy as saying valid or invalid it might be as difficult as you need to look at those test cases and then divide them into how they need to be treated together so so but we I'll go through another example for you to analyze the techniques okay so we continue for from there right now so a good example is this right so in the last example I did one so this is also kind of wrong one minute so for for this now let's say we have this particular text box that accept number from 1 to 99 right so and we've done similar one for equivalent partitioning right now so for equivalent partition we only have two partitions for the valid one and for the invalid one so in this case we can decide to take five and we can take zero and we can take 100 those are the three test cases that we want in this particular instance so because we are only going to take one partition one test case from each of the partition one from the invalid which is from less than zero we can take minus one or zero and also for the valid one we can decide to take let's take five and also for the invalid one we can take hundred or we can take one or two or anything greater than one hundred those are for the equivalent partition so if you go to the boundary value the same question the same scenario and then for different techniques this time around so so if you now look into that so now we know like I said before that we know some of the issues that we have is basically at the boundary when developers uh, wanted to write greater than and they write greater 
or equal to. Sometimes when they wanted to write less than, they mistakenly write greater than. So those are the issues that you have at the boundary. So now, so for you to be able to catch those errors, you need to now test at the boundaries. So in these instances, what you need to do now, you need to have test case that covers the boundary because you know if you're able to um, address the boundary, the inside would behave the same thing, right? The inside of the uh, of the boundary will have the same because they are on the same partitions. They will do the same thing. They will behave the same way. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at our numbers that is going to be accepted. So we know it's going to accept 99. No, it's going to accept one. We don't, it's going to accept number from 1 to 99. So we take 1 as number that is in the valid partition. Uh, we take 99 as a number that is also within the partition of the valid ones. And also, those two numbers are in the boundaries. So, and also, what we can also do is to say, what at our invalid ones, invalid data. The zero is one which is right at the edge of the boundary. So, and also we look at uh, after 99, what is the next value after 99? So that is 100. Then we build our test cases to that. So in some cases, some people will use like three data at the boundary, which is means that you have zero, one, and two. And you have 99, no, 98, 99, and 100. Some people can also go ahead and say, instead of saying 100, you also say 101. But what that does for you is like, because, like I said, if the developer has said less than or equal to or greater than or plus one, something like that. So you consider that 100 is not accepted, 101 is not also accepted. So once you're able to consider those two, you don't worry about what, what are the next one after 101. The same way also, you consider 98 and you consider 99. So, and also you consider one and two. Because it's possible that one is not accepted, but should, two should be able to accept. So you consider those two. So, but in a simple scenario, you just want to say, I consider zero not to be accepted. I want to consider one as being accepted. I want to consider 99 as being accepted. And I want to also consider 100 as not being accepted. So you have your valid scenario, valid data as 1 and 99, and also your invalid as 0 and 100. So those are how you want to write your test cases for that. So another good example that I will have found right now is you have an application also that accepts uh, password and this password should be minimum of six characters and maximum of 10 characters. So in this case, it's not as easy as what we've done at the former one where we have invalid and valid. So it's, it's more than that. So this one, we, you have partitions. So you have more than two partitions in there. So you have 0 to 5, right? Because 0 to 5 characters should not be accepted. 6 to 10 characters should be accepted. And also you have 11 to 14 or 11 to whatever it is uh, should not be accepted. So that's what you want to you want to do. So now you want to enter any number, any um, length from 0 to 5. So preferably, I would say you want to test that if I don't enter any password, we start going to be fine. And you want to also use 5 also, like using the boundary. So, but in this case, you can see that we are going to be using um, equivalent partition and boundary value analysis together. So in this case, because you're going to be um, putting your test cases into partitions, at equ equivalent partitionings, and also you're going to also be using the boundary. 
of that particular partition that you already set out. So our first partition is zero to is zero to five. Our second partition six to ten, and the next partition is eleven to fourteen. So those are the partitions that we set. But also we're going to be using the boundary value of those partitions. So now we're going to set send is zero. That means we are not going to enter any password, and we're going to pe press enter. So then we should expect an error to be displayed. And the same way also, you want to also write a letter or a password of length of five. And then you should be able to see that the error is also displayed because the minimum character should be six. So, and that should be your invalid um, um, test. So you also need to do your valid one. So you enter six characters and if you accept it, and you also you enter a password with 10 characters and that also should be accepted. Then after that, you also want to consider your invalid characters, also your invalid test cases also. At the invalid test cases, you want to enter 11 characters, so because that also is at the boundary. So and also you want to enter, yeah, I think that should be should be fine because from 11 is not I don't I wouldn't say 11 to 14. So because it could be like forever. So to be honest, so and that is it. So you can put any number that you want. So that's what. So and those third part, uh, the third partition should not be accepted so that is a, uh, is a is a good example for you so that is also a practical one also that you can use to when you're going to mix the equivalent partition with boundary value analysis so that is that for the uh, techniques so any question so we're going to go to the test management so is basically how tests can be managed. And I said, there are a lot of things that goes into testing that uh, as a professional tester, you need to consider. And also, you're going to be reporting to a test manager if you are one, if you are not a test manager, or if you're a test manager also, you have responsibility that you need to uh, do. You have some tasks that you need to do. And also, if you are a test analyst also, there are some tasks that you need to also do as a tester. So, and um, this is what we're going to focus on in this particular session uh, of the training. So, so as a test manager, what are you going to do? As a test manager, you are meant to do Apologies for that. So as a test manager, you are meant to do the test planning. So and also test control. So basically you based on your experience in testing, so you and also in quality management and also project management, you kind of do resource planning and everything. So uh, your responsibility of the responsibility of a test manager would be writing and coordinating the test policy and also developing the test approach. And also you'll be the eyes of the testers, also representing them and also putting test perspective into the project. So, and also it's gonna be include hiring of new testers and also procuring of testing resources or tools and everything. So, and you're going to be introducing and also selecting the right and also suitable test strategy. So, yeah. So as I said, as a test manager, you would be selecting right strategy and right method for your team. And also you also going to be selecting the right tool also. I know there's a concept of um, test 
architect also that does this also but in some cases you will follow on the lap of the test manager to be able to select the right tools and also to organize those tools and also provide training for the test team and also in most cases also you might also need to coordinate the test environment as a test manager your test manager might also coordinate or also decide on the test environment that we need to use and also the automation test too. So also it also involves introducing an optimizing supporting process. I also also you might also need to introduce on uh, different metrics so to define the test to um, test plan. So we're going to talk about test plan in, in a moment also. So you need to evaluate the metrics that you need to use also. Uh, I've seen some uh, some people are working in a situation whereby um, they see oh, the resource uh, that the hired has to uh, write 10 test cases in a day, 5 test cases in a day, or how many inbox. To be honest, that, I, I don't think that's a good way to measure performance. So, but we're going to look into that later, to be honest, so if time permits. So, but you need to have the right way to evaluate, evaluate or evaluating your metrics. So, and the right way and also to measure performance of the resource that you have. So, and also you need to know how to measure test results, test prog progress also. So more often than not, might not be based on number of box that a tester has raised or you know, how number of button test plan they've written. But in this, you'll be with that to adapt the right test plan and also on test results and progress of of the test. So and as a test manager, also you need to have a way or a suitable metrics for measuring progress, as I said, and also evaluating the quali quality. Of testing, this is where I really want to evaluate or emphasize actually that evaluating quality of the testing sometimes is another issue for test managers. Sometimes most of them don't know how to evaluate it, so they evaluate based on uh, numerical numbers that how many test cases have been written, how many um, bugs have been raised which I think is not the right way to do it, to be honest. So, because some someone can write high-level uh, test cases, and a person can go into low level. Not for everyone. So we need to know that. And also, as a test manager, you also would be communicating the report. You need to be doing a report of your testing and to the stakeholders. So, okay. Now, coming to test analyst. So, what are the responsibility of a test analyst? So, so basically, in Notche, you are going to be doing the testing. <laughs> you are going to be doing the testing. The first thing that you need to do is reviewing the requirements and we've said right now that we have three different approaches so based on what we have. So if you are going to be using a specification based approach, if you are going to be using a structural based approach which is not technically for a test analyst or it basically will be useful for a developer but you might also want to be want to use experience based if there's no requirements. So, but if there's requirements, you need to review that requirement first, actually. So that means, as a new tester, if you want to start testing, what do you need to start from? Maybe that's one question that someone asks. So you need to ask the requirement. Where is the requirement? Why am I testing? So there should be a document that is being written, whether it's in written in Gaking or is written in BDD, is been written in a format that business can understand. There should be a requirement that you would be based, your test should be based on. So, but it, that is if you are going to be using specification based. If there is no requirement, then what they are expecting you to use is experience based. So, maybe for a new tester, so that kind of role might not be for you, to be honest, because 
if there's no requirement, you might struggle. So you may need to base your um, testing on experience. So if you find yourself in that situation, what will you do? You need to talk to people that's got experience in that particular application or in, the, in testing the similar application to be able to guide you to, so that you can be able to perform. Then having reviewed the requirements also, you need to design your test cases. So we've just um, gone through uh, test techniques. So in designing your test cases, you need to go through the techniques again to say, how do you bring your test data out and what are the steps for you to do that? So you need to go back to the um, text techniques, test techniques that we've um, just gone through. So then you need to write your uh, test specifications. So someone sent a mail to me this afternoon and said, oh, they, they asked me to write test scenario. What is a test scenario? So, and I said, <laughs> it's basically like you're into add your steps, your scenario in the steps. What are you going to test? What steps do you need to pass through? Just to make it in a layman way, actually. So to say, because sometimes you, you, we have different way of calling this thing. Sometimes it's even confusing. We don't even know which one is the right way. So people talk about test conditions, which is basically, I would say that's the right way to call it. Test conditions, which is like your feature that you want to test. And also, they also mention about test script, which is basically how you want to test the particular test condition. So, and also test specification. So, which is the steps also to make sure you test those applications. And they call it maybe test scenarios and everything. So, uh, sometimes just Google it out, Google it out and know what exactly the person is talking about. So, and then also while doing that, also you need to prepare and also create your test data. So, and I say, while you are designing your test cases, of course, your test data is part of what you need to be preparing or creating. So that's another thing. So, and for automation also, of course, I, like I said, we're going to do automation as part of this training. So I, like someone asks if program experience is required when I was in the introduction. And I said, yes, if you have a program experience, it makes it to be far, far better than the others that we are not. So, but you could also learn it also. You could learn programming also. And also, if you don't have programming experience, I'll try as much as possible to go and make it as simple as possible so that you can be able to pick up some, uh, that um, automation um, training. But I do encourage you to read about C Sharp, know how to program in C Sharp. It will go a long way for you. So, so also as an automation tester, you are meant to automate. You are meant to uh, know different tools. I would advise you also to look into different tools that they are going to be using. Because in this particular training uh, for automation, we're going to be using C Sharp, C Sharp and Specflow. But that is not the only tools that is in the market. So after this, also you also need to go out there and also look at different other tools that are not going to be considered in this particular training. So also, you might also be involved in installing and operating the test environment, so which is also another thing that you might need to do. So and also also you need to set that environment up. Sometimes you might have to support people in setting that up. So it's also another thing that in other role that you might enter, this would already been set up for you. You don't need to do anything. You just go in there and start using it. But you might also find yourself in a situation whereby there's nothing at all. So no test environment for you to use. But it's not going to be a big issue for you, to be honest. Setting up a test environment is not that big. Your test environment could be as easy as your the laptop that they gave to you to use. So, and that's it. It might be also be more difficult that you have to create your website yourself. You have to deploy database yourself. You have to make sure that even log into Azure. And it might be as difficult as that. But it might also be as easy as 
just get a laptop, the website is there, and there you go. So that also is something that you need to consider. So uh, as time goes on also, you would be reviewing your test plan, test cases, the one that you've written before, and also using different tools. You need to measure um, the your performance also. You need to log in your test, and also you need to also document results. I think last time I spoke about how to document your bugs. Also, what do you put in your box? So I said, if you are testing an application, and where you are testing an application, you found a bug, what do you do? You create, uh, I think, on the last Tuesday, you, they actually went through, if you missed that class, I think, when I post the video, so be, to, to watch that video, is about the practical part of um, working through your work item and also raising bug. I know, I think Timmy also uh, run through how you can create your box. So when you create your box, you put your description of the box in there. You put, you can put the severity, you can put the priority of that particular box, and you could the description step to create that particular box. If there's any screenshot or any error message that you've seen, you put that in. Any information that you think that you have and could be useful, you put them there also. And if there's any log from anywhere, you put them there. So so those are very, very important so so that the step can be easily recreated. So so you you need to, to do that. So that is that for test analysis also. So and you also have overall approach to strategy of the of testing. So and this is the thing that I said for a tester, if you join an establishment today, the first thing you need to ask for is their test strategy, if there's any. So and if there's none, I like I said, you need to start putting one together. So it's very, very important for a test, um, a QA team to have a test strategy because it's kind of the Bible for, for, the, for the team. So, and I've mentioned about test environment before, you need to decide on the test environment and also you need to define different level of testing that needs to be done. Because one, this is very, also very, very important. I think someone might ask the question that, uh, so, in when you are writing your test, actually, even during your test, this is this particular part in terms of test level would be in your test strategy. You need to know what the test strategy you are following. So which test level that you want to concentrate upon. So what I have to say, am I going to be doing unit testing? Or is it developer that are going to be using testing? Are we going to be doing system testing? Uh, are we going to be doing integration testing? So we need to, you need to know which test level you are focusing upon, actually. So that is very, very important. And also, which testing activities that you've been employed to do. Are you a manner tester? Are you an automation tester? Are you a performance tester? Are you all together going to be doing the same thing? So this is very, very important to actually get that information even from your te from your line manager to s so that you know what you've been employed to do really so also you need to know a way to evaluate your results your test results to see if it means the requirement and also one thing I want to also say also maybe I'm, I'm not sure is on this slide it's you need to know, define your test exit criteria. What is your test exit criteria? When do you say, when can you say I have finished testing? And we know that from previous one that you cannot exhaustively test your application. But when can you say enough is enough? When can you stop testing? So those are the things that goes into the test strategy. To say, for a good example would mean that Oh, when there's no money, yeah, you can stop testing. Of course, that is the easy one. But when can you stop testing? When can you stop testing? That is what you specify in your exit criteria. 
So it could be as simple as when you cover all your test cases, when you cover all your specifications, or when all the bugs has been fixed, when there's no high priority bugs or something like that. Or yeah, those lists has to be explicitly uh, explicitly stated in your test strategy. So then, so also how much documentation is required and it also should be prepared. So you need to also know that. So when you are um, starting a job, you need to know what documentation is required for you to prepare. So, and also writing test plan. So who does that? Who write it when and how much of it? So you need to you need to know that. So more often than not, I think writing test plan is the role of a test manager. So and sometimes also a test analyst also who have their own input into that. So okay. No, also you need to estimate test effort and test cost. So uh, I think in the first lesson I mentioned about uh, grooming in Agile. So which another thing. So during the grooming session, you might be required to estimate your effort, your test effort, to see uh, how many hours or time, or in some cases when people are using points, what is the point for your testing. So you may also be required to do that. So one of the you know, techniques that people do often use to estimate test effort is to say that let's assume let's assume you are um, writing a test cases for a requirement of maybe five lines. So you now look at okay for the five lines, how, how many hours is it going to take me to do one line? If it's going to take you to do um, five hours for for a line, so then you can as well just multiply it by five times five, twenty-five, twenty-five hours. That's the easiest approach to use. The same way also for even um, for testing also. You've created your test plan, you've created your test plan, everything is there. So and you're about to execute it. If your if a test plan or a scenario is taking you like two hours to test, so you could as well estimate it. It's actually like a guesstimate anyway, to say one requirement is taking me two hours and I've got ten requirements to test. So it's gonna be two times ten. So which is basically like 20 hours so you can ask you uh, use that approach so so that is that for the test management we're going to look into test planning right now so so we're going to look at test planning now so So, uh, like I said initially, I said everyone, I mentioned everyone can do testing, but this is what separates everyone from testing. So, in normal other people that do testing, they don't do planning. You don't sit down and say, so for instance, if you buy a new uh, iPhone, you would do user acceptance testing, technically. That's what is, is called user acceptance testing because you look at the, uh, um, the phone, and uh, you want to confirm that it meets your requirements. So you would do user assistance testing. But you will not go and start to write a test cases out. You will not sit down and say, oh, okay, now what am I looking for in this um, application or in this particular phone? So you won't, you won't start doing that. You have your requirements on, in your head and you start to, to do your testing. But if you are doing testing professional is totally different. You need to do planning. You need to do preparation. So and this preparation and planning start as early as possible in development life cycle. So and also uh, we need we'll look into what goes into a test plan right now. So to see. So let's look into that. So according to this particular IEE document, so it's kind of an old one, so I'll see um, there should be a new version. But according to this, so what do you need to put into your test plan? So a test plan should have your test plan identifier. 
which is basically a number that you attributed to your test plan. So to see this test plan for 001 or something like that. And you're going to put a brief introduction of about the test plan. So you're going to say oh, what that test plan is all about and put a quick introduction of that. You could just Google out a sample test plan to see how it looks like. And I said, in some cases, you might have a test manager that will do that for you, or you could also need to do that for you for every project. But of course, you will have a test um, strategy already created. If not, you might also need to do that. So for a test plan, so I said, you, you have the test plan identifier, you have the introduction, and also test items. So you list all the items that you have to be tested. So then the next one, which I think is one of the most um, important parts of the test plan, so is you add your features to be tested. What are the features that you want to test? So you list all the features that you want to, to test. So I want to test the login, I want to test the registration, I want to test. So every feature that you should be considered as part of the test plan. So, and also you have your feature not to be tested. So this is kind of like, uh, um, what are the features that you want to exclude from this testing? So for instance, we can say, oh, we don't want to do um, closing of accounts at this particular time because we don't have an account to close. So then therefore, we're going to exclude that particular feature in, in our testing or because this particular functionality is not ready, it's not yet developed or it's not going to be developed or the entry criteria is not yet met for this particular feature. So you're going to remove that. So also, what are your approach to testing? What are different things that you want to test? So then also, you want to also list your item pass or a criteria. So I mentioned this before. So if you want, what are the criteria to establish an item field or as passed? So also, what basically, what is your exit criteria? How can you say this test has passed or has failed? So you want to be able to put that down. Another part you put in your test plan is suspension criteria and resumption um, requirements. So this is like when you are testing, you might be in a situation whereby you start your testing. When you start your testing, and the test fails. So uh, you want to suspend a test. Uh, so let's say you want to say the test is blocked, so to say. So what are the criteria that you want to use to determine that a test is blocked? It could be as simple as saying that, oh, that particular functionality is no longer available, or that test cannot be executed because there are other tests that is blocking it, or there's a bug in that particular application. So then what is your resumption criteria? For instance, if there's a bug for that particular test, then the resumption requirement could be that the bug has already been fixed, or the developer is not around to fix it, then when the developer is around, then you can continue. Uh, so you need to put those suspension criteria and resumption requirements in this particular session of the test plan. Then also, test deliverables. What are different deliverables that you want to uh, submit or you want to deliver to the stakeholders? So you, like, of course, there will be you need to list those on deliverables here. So maybe your test cases, your test conditions, your test reports, your bugs that you've list and you found, and different documents that you pre prepared, your screenshot, your um, to show that the test pass or fails. So if you are also doing automation script, also your automation script that you've done. So everything that you would be um, expected to deliver has to be written at this particular uh, section of your test plan.
So, and also your testing task. What are the things that you need to do? What are the tasks or uh, activities that um, you have to perform? Environmental needs, like I mentioned about this before. So if you are meant to set up environment, which environment is, so how do you set it up? What do you need? Which resource do you need? Which requirement do you need? So these are going to be listed there. And also responsibility, who does what and when? So what is your own responsibility uh, like or you are, at this point you need to mention people and say oh, oh the developer is the one that is doing this the QA is doing this performer tester is doing that so uh, all the, uh, and also even the test manager also is responsible for this so your requirements and your responsibilities are listed at these particular sessions so then staffing and training needs so what are the staff that we need and what are their capabilities and what they need to do and what training do they require. So those also goes into this section. So schedule, what's the plan, how do we need to deliver it, when is it going to be delivered. So that also comes into, that, into this section. So then risks and contingencies. So this is so also very, very, also very important. Very This is also this very, is very, also important. very important. You did. Excuse me, sorry. So, so in terms of the risks and contingencies, so what it's, these are also very, very important parts. So in terms of risks attributed to that particular uh, application and also uh, which type of risks based testing you are doing and also what are the project rigs, product rigs attributed to that particular uh, project and also what are the contingencies so in case uh, uh, there's any risks that will happen how do we mitigate those particular risks that's attributed to that project so and the last part is approvals so you need to send the approvals to um, whoever needs to approve the test plan. Maybe your test manager has to approve, um, the delivery manager or also development manager has to approve so that everyone buys into this particular test plan. So that this is what we call, for this particular project, this is our test plan. And this is, this is it. So this is what we're going to go through. And this is what we're going to test. So everyone has to be on board on this particular one. So that is what you need to put into your test plan. Yeah, so uh, Trello is a project management tool that is used by most companies. So I think I've seen it's been used for in most of my projects like two places. So we're going going to go through how it's been used so from scratch so I've just created a new team so then we can see the process how that goes so just follow me through the journey so this is just a new board I have created so now let's start from beginning so we got a new company already created and then you can create a new board. So let's say this is for manual testing. So let's say it's blue sky manual testing. And then you can create a board. So now, so you have the board here. So in a place the people have different ways they are going to be using Trello. So, and we're going to look into different ways. But I will uh, actually give you one of the process that I was used to. So, the first thing that you have when you have is maybe backlog. Mm -hmm. 
You have backlog, so then in analysis, we put a in development or oh, before then ready for dev, then this will be in development. Dev done. Or some people can call that ready for QA. Then in QA, QA done. Then this might be done, done, or or closed. So we have these different uh, stream lanes actually. So what you're going to have when you start a new story is going to be on your backlog. So every story, let's say we go to gifrid.com and then we're going to say let's do about home page. So, login, registration, wish list, community. Yeah, it's not loading anyway. So, then closing account. Then you have, yeah, let's just look into that one. So now you've got all your requirements that you want to, you want to test, uh, but they are right now in your backlog, they, you don't have anything. So you continue putting all those requirements there until then we are ready. So what's going to happen, then the BA will take that into in analysis right so then it's going to now write everything in Gherkin or in our format they prefer like uh, giving uh, um, on the give home page Or if you give in I navigate. Okay. All right. So this is this could be the requirements that you're going to be you going to get for the home page. So um then they're going to go into the login also, drag the login. So and you can move the login to the instead of backlog. So it's going to be analysis. So. Initially, as you can see, what I did before was to drag the home page into, that, into this in analysis, but you can also change it from 
where, for instance, if you go in there and you can change it from here. So this is now in analysis and you can move that. So let's say now our registration, so given I am on, or let's say we use the same concept, I navigate So Okay, let's make it a level when I So that is that. So let's say now, so what you're going to do, this is a requirement also. So as a tester, so you, you have these three requirements. Let's leave it with that. So let's go with this one also, given So this is going to be the the first one is the valid login and the next one is the invalid login. So this one is a valid one and this one's going to be invalid one. So when you enter invalid username and you enter any password then you click on login then you should not be logged in. So you can have other one also. Oh, sorry, scenario. You 
can have other one also given um, valid username and invalid password. There are other things. So as you can see from our techniques that we've done, which is the equivalent partitioning. So we are partitioning our test cases into different parts. So you can see that. So yeah. So so these are our scenario. So then we can write our acceptance criteria. So in in some cases, some business analyst will write in this form as a user of key phrase I want to log in so that I can perform some activities so they will write something that's your own requirement and this will be the acceptance criteria So the assessment criteria, sometimes the BA might write it for you, or in some cases you might also have to write it together. But that's on the if they've written something like this in this approach, like like a process where you should follow, then you can work that out to work in this. But some of them, some BAs will just write in this approach, which I think is is best. So. Okay, so now let's go back to there. So after the BA has finished or you've reviewed it, you demo move it to ready for uh, development. So it's now ready for development. Let's say this is not ready. You have to do re um, registration. So uh, let's say we do login and registration. So then developers start, so and they move it in John, maybe John is the one that is doing that, James is doing this, and James moved the login, so John is doing registration. So then when they finish, that's a bug. Okay, let's see. 